it is the story of Sive, and we are performing tonight for the first time with a person called Sive, who you will meet shortly. And so we thought, how appropriate to tell the story of Sive. But the story of Sive is a bleak and tragic and awful tale. So uh, we thought, well, let's tell it from a new angle, because we have told this story. This is the story of Fionn McCool's great love, a woman of the other world who turned into a deer and was stolen away by Frederick, the druid of the Tua de Danon, and he never saw her again, but they had a child called Oshin who found his way back to her, him eventually. Uh, it is a dark and tragic tale, and we've told it from Fionn's perspective. Told it from Saeed's perspective. Never told it from this perspective. So yeah, enjoy this one, it's really happy. Yeah. This was a tough one. It was a tough one to speak about this person. Uh, but it was one of those ones that kind of insisted upon itself. And it was only eventually when I realized that this, this person, well, he's someone who needed to speak for himself. And so, with that in mind, I am Ferderok the greatest druid of the Tua de Danon, the greatest and most powerful druid that ever lived. But I was not born into power, no, no. I was not born into beauty, I was not born into great regard. Those were things that I had to fight for and I had to earn. I was born with the magic of the Tua De Danon, the power that we all have. We all have the power to see the world differently, to see what is hidden, and to let it reveal itself to our eyes. We all have the power to change our shape. And in moments of great emotion, that shape change reflects our truest nature. Such transformations can be difficult to shake off. And I had that power, I had that potential. Though when you are self-controlled and self-possessed, you do not let such wild powers loose. It is very unwise. And I was not counted high among the two of Danon. And so the lovely women of the Tua de Danon, when they looked at me, they looked at me with disdain. If they looked at me at all, their eyes would pass over me, pass through me. But I learned a great power. I discovered a great gift that only I had the power to control. I could see. I could see more wide ranging than anyone else who had ever lived before me. Because I learned to see through the open sky, from the open sky. I could see down over everything that happened under the sky. Every secret tryst every hidden meeting. Everything that happened under the sky was open to my eyes. And with secrets came power, and with power came renown. And then those ladies of the Tua de Danon who had looked right through me before, well then they looked at me with different eyes. but I had no regard for them. But there was one. There was one woman. Her name was Sive. Sive was not like the other women. She was beautiful. They were all beautiful. But she had a sweet shyness that begged for protection. 
she had a kindness and a light to her that I found compelling, appealing. And I thought, now that I was so highly regarded, so well renowned, this is a woman who could be my equal. I could give her that privilege. And there came a night when we were at a feast together and Saiv and I got to talking. And as the night wore on and others left, she and I stayed. She doesn't tell you that part, how she stayed late into the night, just her and me, talking, laughing. She knew what she was doing. She knew what that meant. And so, when I reached out for her, it was the most natural thing in the world. And she recoiled from me. As if I, as if I was going to hurt her, as if I ever would. She pulled back, she pulled away. And I just needed her to listen. Just to stay and listen for a second, not to go running off, running her mouth, spreading foul rumors about insinuations that I would be that kind of man. Because I wasn't. I never was. And in my hands, she twisted. She drew on that power of transformation in her panic, turning into a creature. And I expected something reasonable of her still. Something soft and tame and acceptable and respectable, but she didn't turn into anything like that. She turned into the most pernicious creature. She became a deer and she kicked me, gouging a cut in my cheek. She doesn't tell you that either, as she leapt and twisted away. And she fled from the other world into the mortal world. And I thought, well, well, let her. Let her see how hard life is without beauty to soften the hearts of others. Let her see how she gets on without the protection of a man like me. And I was ready. I was ready. Any time she came back and apologized, I would have forgiven her. I would have forgiven her in a heartbeat, taken her back, let her be by my side. And I watched her and I worried for her out there in the cold, shivering under the open skies. I kept an eye on her. I wasn't going to let anything happen to her. But if she needed to be reminded of her place, then she could take the reminder. And then one day I cast my gaze out over the skies and I couldn't find her. She was gone. She was somewhere else. She was hidden from me, hidden away. And I worried. I worried for her. I fretted and I searched. And when I found out where she'd gone, my heart sank. She had gone into the house of a man. She had gone into the house of a man who was everything that I despised in a man. A man a ruffian, 
leader of a gang of cutthroats and thieves. A man so in love with his own beauty, he couldn't possibly love a woman, not the way I loved her. This Fionn McCool with his golden hair, I could imagine the promises that he made her. Promises that he was going to break, of course he was. Men like that don't value women like her to him. She was probably just another conquest. Women came to him so easily. Easy come, easy go. I knew he would break her heart. I knew he would desert her no matter what he said. And then the day came that he did leave her. Of course he said it was to go and fight a battle, but I knew. He was going to go, and he was going to find someone else, and he was going to leave her heartbroken and behind him, never to think of her again. And so I came to find her. I came to bring her back home to be with me where she belonged. And if that was what she wanted in a man, I could be that for her. I could make myself tall and broad-chested and long-haired. He had two wolfhounds by his side. Well, I could conjure two hounds, coo and a she, creatures of smoke and ash and fire to run on leashes by my side, dangerous and under my control. And when she saw me walking up the hill, she ran out to greet me. My heart lifted. For a moment I thought, she's recognized me. She knows and she's ready to apologize and to come home. But when she got closer, she turned again, twisted again, became again that wretched, wild thing. And I thought if she insists on behaving like a deer, I will treat her like a deer. So I hunted her with my hounds of shadow and fire. I hunted her into a narrow valley the way we hunt deer. And then I called up the cliffs to close that valley to lock her in. It wasn't cruelty. I knew that if she would just listen to me, she would just understand that I loved her. She would come around. She would understand. All she had to do was put aside this willfulness, this wildness, this insistence that she had on running away from me. She just talk to me. And I was so patient with her. Day after day after day, I came to that valley and I talked to her. Day after day after day, months after years and I didn't even say anything about that bastard she dropped I let her keep it she doesn't talk about that how patient I was how that valley was a paradise for a deer everything she could have wanted sweet grass and running water trees for shade and any time she wanted to be reasonable to have an adult conversation I was ready and then the day came when even my patience ran out 
I had tried to be fair, I had tried to be patient, I had waited for so long for her to come to her senses. And she was too stubborn, too obstinate, too wild. And so I decided to bring her back to the other world, back with me, maybe separating her from this world and this man would finally cut the ties and she would finally talk to me. When I put her on the leash and I dragged her to the edge, she kicked out at me. She forced me. She brought that passion on me. And I thought if she is never going to change, if she will only ever be wild with me, then fine, I will be wild and I let that change come over me. And I was ready then to be the wolf that would hunt her across this world and the other world for all eternity. To be the lion that was snapping jaws and rending claws. To be the hawk. I didn't know what form I would take, but I knew what I was. Powerful, dominant, in control. I felt the change come over me. I waited for fang and claw and muscle and sinew and power. And everything went dark. I couldn't understand. I couldn't see anymore, not through my eyes, not through the sky. I couldn't understand where, where were my claws and fangs. I felt so small and naked and blind. I know I am a wolf. I know I'm a lion. I know I'm not. A worm. I'm not a worm. like that one, fairness. Dark, though, you know? Yeah. On, on, on I things. told you it was a rough hang, but we get there in the we end, all right? It was. We get there in the end. I just work on that ending for it. Um, okay, so you're in the listening mood. Uh, Fancy Dan did a great job warming you up and having a crack with you. And listen, the lads over here have been working on the music loads. Um, Cullum and uh, Alan, give them a round of applause, please. You! <laughs> Because we're going to crack into the next story now, and this is a slightly longer one, and uh, it takes place at this time of year. It was a celebration tale, and it's a story of jealousy. It's a story of the darkness of betrayal. It's a story of forgetting. It's a story of, well, what's it a story of? The things that we choose to forget in order to be able to live with ourselves. I knew she'd say it better than me. She usually does. More or less. Something like that. And you might know it as the story of Cucullin's sickbed, or you might know it as the only jealousy of Emer. But we should say there will be an interval at this show, so if people are... We'll give you your piss and break. There'll worry. be a break. There'll be a break. You'll be able to refresh your drinks Hold and it. go to Jack's. Aaron's going to be clenched, though, so it's fine. <laughs> I'm clenching. Are you not clenching? You're, you're, she can't clench. It's okay. <laughs> I never clench. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Um, okay, so, you ready, guys? This story starts at the crux of the new year. 
when everything got dark. But the fires were lit and the reasons to celebrate at that thin time of year when people reflect on the death that they will possibly meet and those that have died before. For the ancestors that have left them, the families that have gone by and the beloved dead that might walk on through that thin veil at the thin time of year when magic is in the air. And the two a day may just stray a little too close and play a trick on those around you. And so you never quite know who's behind those gleaming eyes you're staring into at the time. And on the hill of Clachta, that's where the first fires were lit. But this story takes place next to a lake, a beautiful lake in the plains of Moimertevna where Ku, Cullen and Emer were setting up a brilliant banquet. Fires were going to be lit. The best meats, the hundred values and most choices drinks from all over in the most elaborate, decorated vases and vessels that you can imagine. Well, they were all going to be there for their beloved friends. You see, Ku Cullen had three problems. He was too daring for most of the heroes of the Crave Rua and the Red Branch because he was their best warrior and he took on too much. He was definitely too young. He couldn't even grow a beard. But he was very popular with the ladies because he was too beautiful. He was literally just too good looking. It was a problem. It was one of his main faults. You can look it up. I didn't make it up. And so when he was a young man, well, he was betrothed and married off to Emer, his equal, his only friend possibly, his charioteer and best friend, a man named Leg, set him up with the most beautiful woman in all Ireland. Emer was her name and she's not much descriptions in the old books other than being Haragon of womanhood. So whatever that means to you, that's what she wants think is what it meant. She was absolutely gorgeous. She might have been red-haired, if you're into redheads. Or she was blonde, if you like blondes. She was dark, if she liked dark, you know. But she was known as having sweet voice, honey-worded, beautiful at singing, not only singing, but cantating, cantating and poetry, regaling, and also quick of wit and clever and cunning and sharp as a tick. And really, really good at needlework, because that was important back then. Yes. Still pretty handy now. And she was always surrounded by a hundred serving maids who helped her with the needlework. Maybe they'd helped her a bit too much, but you know, she really liked needlework, I don't know. It was a thing she did with women a lot, very close quarters. But no one was good enough to marry her until Coo Cullen came and well, they were a match for each other in wit, in charm, in beauty, and they realized there was no one else better. And they were going to be matched off with each other, and... They were also a match in having an extremely high opinion of themselves, I think. That too. They both thought they were awesome. Yeah. And then they agreed with each other and were like, well, yes. And Cucullin would spend lots of time battling and off out, away from Thundalgan, where they had their home, but he never really slept alone. He didn't like it. He liked a bit of company. Jealousy was not a thing Emer had. No, no, she wasn't jealous. She had many women to help her out with needlework. I think that's what they call it. Needlework. Listen, I'm just saying you need quick hands for needlework. You need a lot of dexterity. So she was always having fun. Quick I mean, wrists. I'm gonna stop. I mean, Hugh Cullen did have seven fingers, so they say, so they got on very well. And seven lights shining in his eyes, seven colours of his hair, but I think it was the fingers that did it for Aimer. Anyway. <laughs> can't have too many, I don't know. What do you do with the other two? I don't know. I think we've established the conceit now where we can move on. <laughs> okay. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Be here all night. Just doing innuendos. Just give the people what they want. <laughs> 
Chris plot point? Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> in the plains of Mordevna, they decided to have this festival, this brilliant coming of the new year. And they wanted to invite all of the, the most beautiful people. You know, they wanted to get all of the rights close next to them. Because, you know, they were, they weren't, there was no jealousy between them. So, you know, they could just mingle, have fun, and see where it goes. And well, Cullen was happy with the people who they'd invited. Emer was delighted to see such a host from Owen Market come down and boast with all of the drinks and meats that they had displayed. And when the fires were lit and the darkness had descended, they all looked around to see a strange sight. They saw a great flock of birds landing on the lake just as the last light of the evening lit them from behind and these birds were singing beautifully but more unusually than that these birds were linked in pairs with silver chains now Emer saw those birds landing on the lake and she looked around at all the beautiful women of Ulster and she went over to her husband Cullen and she said um, if you catch those birds we can give a pair to everyone here you catch them and I'll hand them out. And Cucullin said, okay. So he got his slingshot, he got his birding net, and he stunned all those birds and ran out onto the lake, scooping them up in the net and handing them back to Emer, who just got a really nice excuse to touch everybody's shoulder and like brush their hair back a little bit and put a bird on each shoulder and make sure that they were singing. And ooh, that's nice embroidery on your neckline. I have learned a new stitch recently. You should come over sometime. You know, next time the boys are away fighting or whatever. I thought we were done with the innuendos. You were, I wasn't. <laughs> so, she gave every woman in Ulster a pair of these beautiful songbirds, one for each shoulder, so that they were sitting there singing into each ear, just being the best party favours ever. And then Cucullin having caught the last pair, and Emer having given out the last pair, they realized that there were none left for her. Now, Emer said, listen, honestly, it's fine. It's kind of a power move to be the only one without a certain piece, you know, if you think about it. Because I have such an incredible voice that I can outsing the birds, frankly. I'm not going to right now, because I haven't warmed up, but I could, if I wanted to. But Cullen really didn't like that. He was like, I really, like, you're my wife and you're the only one who doesn't have the cool thing. And mm, I don't like that. And Emer recognized one of Cullen's mythical sulks coming on. So she said, okay, why don't you just go for a walk around the lake and you come back to us when you've cooled off, babes. So he went to take a little stroll and he saw two birds flying down towards the water. It was now dusk. And these birds were even stranger and more beautiful than the others. There was only two, and they were connected with a gold chain. And Cucullin saw them and said, those are the ones I'll get for my wife. And if he'd thought about it for, honestly, even a minute, he might have realized that that was a bad idea, that it was Samhain now. It was the time when the veil is not even there anymore between the worlds, but he really wanted a pair of birds for his wife. So he made a cast with his slingshot at the birds and an extraordinary thing happened, a thing so bizarre that it shook him to his core. He missed. He never fucking missed, like. He didn't miss. He was shook, but he was also stubborn. So he tried again and he missed again. And then in frustration, he drew his sword, which is not a ranged weapon. He shouldn't try and throw it at things, but he did. In anger, he flung his sword at the birds and the sword hit one of them in the wing and the two of them startled up and flew away. And if he'd been annoyed before, I was nothing to how fucking furious he was now. K 
kicking himself, kicking the ground, absolutely enraged, boiling with frustration. And so he kept walking around the lake because he knew Emer would kick him out of the party again if he went back in a foul mood. And as he came to a pillar stone by the side of the lake, a strange and sudden weariness came over him. And he lay down and he fell asleep. And as soon as he fell asleep, he had a dream. And it was one of those dreams where you are still lying in the place that you went to sleep, but you're seeing things that aren't there. And he saw two women walking towards him across the surface of the water, one in green, and one in red and the woman in red was weeping and the woman in green was laughing and they were each carrying thin hazel rods and they were both very beautiful and they came over to where Cucullin lay because he was dreaming of himself in the dream and they started whipping him lightly with the hazel rods and he thought nice okay <laughs> Not like that. And then they started really whipping him a little bit harder and he went, ooh, okay, uh, I don't think we, was there a safe word? Um, I don't think there was. I think we should talk, maybe take a pause. Okay, no, we're not taking a pause. They started to hit him extremely hard. They started to beat him with the hazel rods and everywhere they struck now left not pain behind, but numbness. And that dream that was all that he dreamed and he did not wake now the rest of the host that was gathered they all had a great time the birds were singing Emer was doing her best to go around and keep everyone nice and safe and sound and she was keeping an eye out for the return of Cucullin, but she was beginning to worry and wonder. But the music was played and the people, well, they drank their fill and they drifted off as you will. And eventually the sun began to rise in the early morning. And well, she realized Cucullin was not coming home. And she sent out a few of her messengers to find where he was, and they found him fast asleep. Now, no one would wake Cucullin. From the first time he joined the boys' troop in Awamaka, when a servant tried to wake him to go to training and ended up very dead, people decided not to wake him up anymore. And so everyone was skirting around the sleeping Cullen, but gradually Emer told them to carry him to his bed. And three days and three nights went by with him sleeping solid, getting paler. And she realized she had to now pour milk between his teeth. All of the people had gone back to their own homes and now they had to go back to theirs, down to Dundalgan, carrying him fast asleep in an otherworldly slumber, she realized. This was something that she could not fix. And she worried and she wondered. And she began to stay with him each day and each night. And as the darkness descended, she got colder still for the lack of arms that would hold her and keep her warm in those long, dead nights. As the trees lost all of their leaves and the darkness felt so bleak without her husband there, she looked at him with pity and she did not want to pity this man, ever. And yet, she had to care for him as if he was next to death's door and she didn't know how to do it but gradually as the warmth began to come back into the world towards Imbolc and flowers began to emerge and light began to come back he still stayed in bed nearly dead she thought better off if he would die if he wouldn't get up but still she held on to hope and she cared and she washed for him. She cared for him. She fed him through his 
closed mouth. And as the summer months began with Biotina and everyone going out celebrating the warmth in the air and the plants that were growing there, the, the beginning of the ripening and seeing the fruits beginning to grow and so she asked the herbs, the greatest of the druids to make potions, concoctions, anything she could think of to wake this man up, but nothing would do, nothing would suffice. And so the summer ebbed on and no one came down from Owen Maka still. No one was sent, only those she sent for. And she began to realize this was not going to ease off. And as now autumn leaked, on in and so and began to creep towards them still a year a year and a day since the day he'd slept still she saw him there and so she put on her gown and that frown on her forehead began to beat in her chest and anger rose as she left for Owen Maka she came into the hall of the king where the Crave Rua were all assembled and she did not curtsy and she did not bow. She looked every one of them in the eye and said, you should be ashamed of yourselves. If any one of you had been struck down by a sickness from the other world, do you think Cucullin would have rested? Do you think he would have taken a single break? Do you not think he would have scoured the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting until he brought back a cure? Not one of you has even visited. So afraid you all are of weakness of body. So terrified of seeing reflected in him the thing you fear the most about yourselves, that one day your strength will leave you. You're too scared to face it. You're too scared to acknowledge it. You'd rather sit here and pretend Pretend that he's away on one of his adventures. Pretend that there is nothing wrong. Wait and see, will he wake up by himself? Well, I'm telling you now, he won't. And I have tried everything I can think of and I won't do this for another year. Either you figure out what's wrong with him and bring him back or I, with all my love and sharpened steel, will send him on to the next world because he would rather die than live like this. You should be ashamed. And they were. Her words cut them because they saw the truth in them. And every one of the Crave Rua then hung their heads. The king went to Kaffa, his druid, asked him if there was anything more that he could do, if there was anything more that could be done. And Kaffa, with all his power, managed to rouse Cú Cullen, only enough for him to speak, only enough for Cú Cullen to tell them the dream he had had at Samhain. And Kaffa said, well, let's bring him back then. Let's bring him back to that lake, to that pillar stone where this first happened. And maybe if we're lucky, and Samhain, the ones who did this to him, will return and explain and give us a way to break the spell that's on him. And so they brought Cú Cullen back to the pillar stone and laid him down. And they looked and they waited and they watched. The sun set, the darkness descended and they all watched and they waited. And then as they looked across the lake with the moon high in the sky, the reflection bright. They saw a strange shimmer on the lake. They saw a green gown flowing from underneath the water, attached to a woman with bright hair walking from underneath the water there. And she was walking with a smile in her lips, pale skin bright eyes, an emerald gown, and suddenly the mirage underneath the water stood on top of that, came walking still over the lake, 
as if this was glass. And she walked straight up to them as if her feet didn't fully sink into the ground. And the sound of her voice was honey and roses. They all looked at one of the sheep. Her name was Liban, she said. And she was the sister of Fan. And they had come a year ago because of the love Fan had had for Cucullin. She just wanted to look at him. She had left her husband, Manon McLear, who wasn't overly happy about it. But they'd come and simply looked, and he had insulted these women of the sheep. And they put this sickness upon him. But Lieben had come back this day to remove this sickness and ask Cullen for the favour she wanted. For now her husband, Louis of the swift hand and sword, was in trouble in the many coloured lands of the other world, where you might think is all brilliant and peace and beauty, but no, she said. There is just as much war and strife and darkness with those that live eternally than those that die each time around. And so her husband needed the strength of Ku Cullen to fight off St. Khan and... Oki Ewell. Oki Ewell. And Oki... Inver. There we go, yeah. Fucking name it. To be fair, we only found those ones yesterday. But these three kings of the other world, they were going to invade and kill her husband. And Louis needed the strength of Cucullin and his warp spasm to defeat this army that were closing down on them in the other planes. And if Cucullin agreed, she lifted off that sickness. And Cucullin blinked open his eyes and stared in surprise at everyone. He'd heard everything. Jump to his feet. No. He said, Before I go, I'll send Leg. Leg will go. Because they might play a trick on me. They might, you know, cast another spell. They might keep me in the other planes. After all, time moves differently in the other realm. And if you agree to show Leg around, this way, he'll report back to me and then then I'll go. Still not getting up, still lying down, still staying solid where he was. Leg said, yeah, no worries. Cucullin said, <clears throat> he was from the north, he said, actually, I could do the drink. You want a drink? It's about time for a drink. No, seriously, do you want a drink? Lads, can we leave the house lights up a little bit, actually? Because I can't see anybody and it freaks me out. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, there, there you are. are. There you are. Oh, look at you. Hello, look guys. How are we getting on? That's ah. better. I'm not just talking into a black hole. Yeah. It's kind of nicer this way. It's terrible. Thank you, you so much. That's great. You can see you, people now. You're okay to be um, seen, right? Not hiding behind your glasses. I know. I'll hide here. It's okay. You can hide behind your glasses if you want. But now we can make eye contact. Great. Okay, so <clears throat> we left you off there in a bit of a, yeah, the middle of the story just because we had some technical issues we had to deal with and bathrooms to visit. Yeah. So. Technical issues like being embodied in a human form temporarily. <laughs> it's an inconvenience. It, <laughs> it just can is. be. It fucking can be. So we're, we're, we're going to come back now. We're going to tell you the end of that story and then... Something else is going to happen, and it might have something to do with these ropes beside me, and it might not. I'm not going to tell you. So where were we? We were with Cucullin Cullen and Emer. Oh, yeah. She, he had sent Leg off to the other world, and Cucullin Cullen was still lying there yeah. with Emer. He was still lying there with Emer. And... He was, 
he was able to feel the difference. You know when you've been sick for a long time and you feel that little oh, bit of energy coming back into your body and it's different and it's new, but he was also feeling frankly nervous. His strength had never failed him before and here he was, a year in his sick bed. And so Emer looks at him and she said, you're, you're fucking scared, aren't you? No. And he said, no, I'm fucking scared, no. She said, you are, you bollocks. Listen. <laughs> First step is the hardest. You're going to stand up now. And you're going to feel a lot better after you stand up. And then you're going to take a step. And you're going to feel better after that step. And then you're going to take another step. And I reckon by about the fourth or fifth step, you're going to feel yourself again. And if there's work to be done to get you back to where you were, we'll do it. But you have to get up first. And it was the hardest step he'd ever taken. It was the hardest move he'd ever made to sit up and stand up out of his sickbed. But with her encouragement? Prodding. Prodding. Mythic prodding. Uh, loving, bullying. I don't know what you call that. But anyway, it was the right kind of move to get him back up on his feet. And he did. He felt his strength come back to him. And while there were only a few people he would allow jibe him or prod him or annoy him into action, and the leg was one, and Emer was certainly the other. And so when Leg returned from the other world and reported of the beauty of the plains, of the many colored lands, the mythical islands, three times 50 lands of the other world, the crystal bridges, the tall towers reaching the sky, the crazy creatures that twisted inside their skin, and the amazing emerald castle that was built, that Louis of the Swift Hand had built for himself and Liban, and her sister Fond, well, when he described how Fond looked, and the fact that Fond had a crush on Cucullin, Cucullin really felt very game face. He was like, yeah, I'm good to go. Highly motivated. Highly motivated. He said thanks to Emer and quickly went with Plague to the other world. And there he met Louis of the Swift Hand in that brilliant emerald castle and he told him of the destruction that was waiting for them. Three great factions, an army coming for them with monsters from the depths of the sea with three heads on them, angry turns and twisted corners, these bodies that were made up and pieced together with magic and darkness. And this army was coming towards them and Cucullin would have to stand and battle against a ferocious army. Single-handedly, a small faction of fighters they had, but he would have to stand and he would have to do his best. And so he asked Clay to jeer him to jibe him, to mock him. And Leg reminded him of how weak he was, how sick he was, lying in bed, unable to get out instead, and scared of this fight, afraid. And when he heard the words that he knew rang true, something inside of him beat angry. And when Cucullin lost his temper, when he allowed the rage fuel him, he grew in size. Ten feet taller he grew. His hair stood on end. His elbows twisted. His fingers became claws. Teeth were fangs. One eye grew the size of a plate as the other shrank back. The hound of Ulster howled a savage roar and blood erupted from his head a fountain there instead as he ran late as fast as his feet could not fall into the waves that were crashing on the water and he ran around the armies that were coming for Louis of the swift of hand and he destroyed them in bloody battle the waves ran red with the blood blood soaked from the battle as if in a dream he had killed so many but now he washed himself 
and he looked about and he found eyes peering at him, unmoving, nearly undressing him, he thought. The eyes belonged to a woman dressed in red, pale skin, brown eyes, and a smile on her lips. This was fun. And she walked towards Cucullin, and Cucullin sidled up to her, and he said, aren't you married to Mananon McLear? She said, aren't you married to Emer? And that was about the last thing they said. Because once they came close to each other, their bodies did the talking, and they came so close, they simply closed the door on anyone else. And this I'm not making up myself. They made love for a month, not stop. Because he had a lot of stamina, and he hadn't done it for a year. So, you know, it was just in him to go. And she had all the time in the world, and she wasn't rushing him. And time moves differently in the many colored lands. And I'm pretty sure they saw some pretty good colors. And in their embrace, they felt each other's heart beating. And they decided that this, this passion, this love, this thing that they had found, this was so profound. No one else had ever felt this before. This was epic beyond compare. And they needed to savor this, this magic, this passion, this beauty. And so a tryst, a magical promise to elope, to stay together forever. They promised this to each other, but Cucullin had to go back home, honor bound to serve his king. And the Crave Rua to belong to Ulster. And he knew he had to be in Ireland for his name to be remembered, for the prophecy that Kaffa had given him to be on the lips of storytellers until the end of time for the great and many deeds he would do, but he hadn't done them yet. And so she would have to come to his home. And she agreed. And he nodded. And they kissed a farewell. And Laig and Cucullin returned to Dundalgan where Emer was waiting. Emer was delighted to see her husband back to himself. And it took a while for her to realize that there was something a bit off about him. There was something strange. She couldn't tell, was it the effect of the sickness? Was it that his confidence had taken a knock? He was definitely off with her. And she couldn't figure it out. He'd never behaved like this before. He'd never been anything less than warm and loving with her. That was why their marriage worked, that when they were together, they were together. For all the time they spent apart, they were present with each other when they were in the same place. And now they were together, but not. And finally, she went to Lake. She asked him what was going on. Now Lake was caught in a dilemma because Cucullin was his best friend, but he'd also been friends with Emer and he'd introduced them and he was a little bit afraid of her. And he was a little bit afraid of him. Uh, but he told her. He said, look, it's nothing to do with me. I promise I didn't. He made a tryst with Fond. They arranged to meet up by a yew tree near the strand and they're gonna run away together. Don't hit me. And she said, oh, I'm not gonna hit you. And that was all she said to Lake. But on the day of that tryst, when Cucullin and Fond met beneath the yew tree, with, he, with her red dress and his red cloak standing out bright against the sky, Emer turned.
turned up, catching them red-handed, and 50 of her closest friends with her, and all of them were armed, not with needles, but with daggers, sharp and bright in their hands. Emer walked towards Cucullin, and if she had been angry before, she was raging now. She said, stand out of the way. I'm gonna fucking kill that bitch. And Cucullin said, no, no, you can't kill her. I'm gonna defend her. And if I have to defend her, then I'll have to fight you. And if I fight you, I'll have to kill you. And Emer said, fucking try. You only want her because she's new. That's always the way it is. Men want someone new, not someone they're familiar with. And you know as well as I do that the fact that she's new and the fact that she doesn't know you like I know you. I know every inch of you and I know every depth of you and I know everything wrong with you and I know all your flaws and all your shortcomings. And I love you still, I love you fiercely, I love you always. And you can't bear to see that. Because I see everything that you don't like about yourself and I love you for it. And you see it in my eyes and you turn away from it and you turn over to someone shiny and someone fucking new. She's not better than me. And Fond, who was standing behind Cucullin, said, you know what, she's actually not wrong. And I'm feeling a little warm wife is extremely um, impressive and she has a point you and she are clearly equals and I had an equal and I left him aside for someone new and I shouldn't have I should have stayed with my husband I should have stayed with Manon on Maglear and I'm a fool for letting him go and as they stood there by the strand, they started to change the argument where Fond said to Emer, you should take him back because he's your equal and I am the one who deserves to be alone because I'm the one who made a mistake. And Emer said, no, no, you fucking keep him. You think I want him back after he was gonna leave me? No, I came here for, I'm not sure what I came here for, but I'm really angry. caught in the middle of this said what wait are we now arguing over who doesn't get me because I'm the most beautiful man in Ireland and they both said shut the fuck up this is not about you <laughs> I mean it is but uh, <laughs> for some reason right now it isn't shut up and Fond lamented again that she had let her husband Mananon McLear go and as they stood by the strand as if he had been conjured Mananon McLear appeared beside them and he looked at Fond and he said, you know, I really only let you go to get him out of your system. And is he out of your system? And Fond said, yes. And Cucullin said, what? <laughs> and Fond said, I'll come back to you. And Mananon said, and I will take you back. And we'll leave these mortals to each other. And he shook his cloak in between Fond and Cucullin. A powerful spell that meant that they would never meet again and with that with the next rising and breaking of the next waves Fond and Mananon were gone and Cucullin and Emer and 50 armed women <laughs> were um, there too <clears throat> Cucullin didn't really know what to say So he went home. <laughs> and he slept on the couch. <laughs> and he made her a cup of tea. Wasn't gonna cut it. 
just kind of skirted around for a while. Just didn't say much. Thought it might all blow over. Weeks went by like this. And suddenly the couples in and around Ulster began to also quarrel a bit more when Emer and Cucullin were about milk literally soured in their presence. No one knew what to say. No one knew what to do. People couldn't really offer advice. And they all really hoped something would happen. So eventually, once all of the men had been kicked out of their beds, because all of the women were pissed off. <laughs> and they didn't know why. They didn't explain it. They were just pissed off. And all the men didn't understand it, but they knew it was Cucullin's fault. Cucullin <laughs> was pissed off too, because he, had, he couldn't ever see Fond again. Yeah, he was heartbroken. He Ooh. was angry. <laughs> yeah, he was angry. It, it, he was pretty sure it wasn't his fault, but he wasn't sure why. So... All of the men of Ulster went to Kaffa the Druid and said, man, you got to fucking do something here. <laughs> and well, Kaffa, and the wisest and the most tactile of the uh, Druids, they, they came up with some form of, of magic and they brewed a potion. And you realise that some hurts and some betrayals are too hard to forget. And so potion they brewed was one of forgetfulness and they brought it to Cucullin and to Emer and they looked at it Cucullin was eating crisps and <laughs> Emer said Fuck, put them down for fuck's sake at the end of the story he's like yeah, yeah okay and uh, he said yeah sorry sorry and so they agreed that they would drink of the potion of forgetfulness so that they could put this behind them because they knew there was nothing they could ever do without a magical potion. And there were some things that are actually better to forget, even if you don't forgive. Okay, so we've one more little thing in store with you, but we'd like now to take a moment and maybe we'll bring the lights all the way down. Yeah? All of the lights. All of the lights. Take them off. Because we call the show The Dark Descends. It's very bright. Oh, other way. <laughs> Close, but you're way off. House we could bring light. down the spotlight and bring down the house lights. Because at this time of year... At this time of year, all of our ancestors observed a ritual. All of the people on this island at Samhain extinguished all lights and sat in the darkness together. Now, there's lights here. There's exit signs and there's up lighters and there's little <laughs> candles, so... All right, okay, just, we get it. Just, just keep the lights down. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to close your eyes really yeah. into it. Yeah. If you want I'm going to gonna suggest that everyone just take a moment and close their eyes so that we can be in the darkness together, eating crisps. Because <laughs> this is a time of year that is about embracing the dark. <laughs> Eating crisps and embracing it. It is about feasting. It's about feasting. It's about joy in life. And it's also about darkness. And what happens when we are in the dark together. And we're not often in darkness these days. There's so many lights around. There's street lights. There's electric lights. But back in the old days, all of our ancestors put out their lights at Samhain and sat in the dark together and sat there and faced the darkness 
Because the darkness hides many things. Things that we're afraid of. Things that we'd rather forget about. Things that we don't want to face. But if we can face the darkness, if we can go into it with courage, there's wisdom to be found in there. It is the great truth of being alive that there will come a day when we are not alive. Every human throughout history, throughout every generation has had to face that truth. And once we had a ritual, once we had a way of facing that together, taking that moment, gazing into that darkness, acknowledging it, letting it teach us. And then, together, we would light the fires and bring back the light. And so this story that I'll tell you now, this is about the forgotten tale, the forgotten woman who stands in the shadow. Bring the lights up. And this is the time where we reflect on a forgotten hero. A hero who knew she would be forgotten. Whose lineage was to leave behind not a trail of destruction and heartbreak, but a gift. A gift of looking into the darkness an invitation to seek what lies in the shadows and this woman has been forgotten until you might find her moving in and amongst the shadow her story has been one that has been shrouded by other names her students became more famous than her although she was brilliant in so many ways. Her strength, her agility, her swiftness, her skill at arms. She was better than the best in High Hill Alban, where her home was. She trained with the greatest of warriors. She maintained such a degree of agility and prowess that no one believed any greatness could come from such a slip of a thing but every time she entered battle she never lost she always won she left a trail of destruction after her until the custom the custom of performing feats was made these brilliant feats that she displayed created and maintained to show off in front of any adversary to strike fear in their hearts so they would not come towards her. And anyone who saw her perform these amazing feats that she created ran away and she avoided many wars that way. Skahawk, her name, the shadowy woman, the one behind the shadow whose feats there were made, who taught in her school these ways of crafting such skill for the Celtic people and every war that was waged with her was a war that was won. And so many of these battles she fought, she didn't face death. She didn't face the hero's death. And she faced a challenge to pass on the feats that she had made the great and brilliant, so many I can't tell you them all, but these were the salmon leap jumping on high through the sky, the darting punch, the thunder strike, the cat leap and that deafening touch. These feats she moved with such skill and such grace, such prowess, that anyone who saw her move this way was terrified. simply 
seeing her move with eye joy and strength. The way she made men quiver in their boots from showing and spinning and moving with grace and skill. Sword or spear did not matter what she used. She would strike fear into the hearts of her enemies. She would make sure what you saw was something you would not face with a fight, but try and find another way to resolve that conflict. And she had the gift of second sight. And she saw a vision of not her death in battle, her giving her gifts, her feats onto students. And so she was angry at this. She wanted her name to be remembered, not to be in the shadows of others, but no, she made it her way to the northeast coast of Scotland, to an island they say got her name, the Isle of Skye today. And she wrapped thorns in her hands, and with bloodied hands she cast the thorns across to the land she would make her home. She made a bridge out of these thorns, and from her dark depths she poured out a dark anger and a magic that sealed this magical bridge to be the final test for anyone courageous enough to come to her school. To train with her, you had to be the best of the best. And this bridge, once made full of thorns, could narrow to the width of a straw for anyone who placed their foot upon it. And they would fall to a bloody death. Or anyone who tried to leap on over, it would buck and it would kick. You had to know exactly how to walk on the thorny bridge to get to Skark School. And still, you had to face so many challenges. The House of Barbs, where a hundred men would challenge anyone coming to get taught by Skark, who was angry still, even though she trained heroes who came to her, she knew these were never going to be as good as her because they would die and their tales would be retold of young boys who were dying early deaths and remembered for the sadness of their tale. But hers would be a tale forgotten. And so she did. She would dream every night and be woken in screaming rage, anger and frustration spinning in her head as she knew that death would not be hers. Death would not be a hero's choice for her. She would not be remembered. Her name would not last on the lips of storytellers, but she would spin on and on and on in the shadows. strange and old from a long, long time ago to monsters that fought in the sea in the north coast on the shore with scales like shields, teeth like swords, and they reddened the waves with the blood they pulled from one another. Something fighting, was it inside of her? Was it a memory from a time gone by? Her feet fell in the way that night to bring her all the way to the coast where the waves were crashing and the wind was lashing and thunder rolled as lightning lit up the sky and she peered down and saw the bones of these old sea monsters there and she pulled at them and she saw a chance to pour her darkness and her anger and her fury that spun in her head down into this spear that she would make and she wrapped this magic around these bones and made the deadly spear the gay bulga 
which would be remembered and never defeated. The spear that would be thrown through the air, making the noise of a thousand swarming bees. It would never miss its target. And when it punctured its victim, the head of it would shatter into a thousand barbs, piercing every organ of that body. And there would be no standing against this spear. And she knew this, and she knew it would not ever be defeated. And whoever wielded this great spear would lead a tragic life. And they would be remembered. And she brought it to her home, and she wrapped it in cloth. And she poured cooling ointment over it and laid seaweed amongst it and buried it in a shallow hole where she knew she would dig again and gift it to one who would be remembered for the tragic, awful, sad and young life he would live. But she, she would stay in the shadow for she knew it was more powerful now to be forgotten, to give her strength to those who may need it in the darkness for those who need it to see her strength from the shadows. So they say that Scott's strength is still in the shadows, waiting for those of you who are brave enough to stare into the darkness as it descends. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you very much, folks. We hope you enjoyed it. We're Candlelit Tales. We had Alan and Colm on music. And Sai, what a wonderful dancer. Thank you so much for joining Hi. us. Of course, my sister Surika. My brother Aaron. We are Candle Tales and best of luck with the rest of this darkness as it descends. Thank you guys. Good night. <laughs>